This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a legendary horror host, and I'm talking about Dick Dizel, a.k.a. Count Gordeval. And um, it's going to be a great show today. That guy was around, he has been around for a long time, you know, Washington, D.C. based, you know, with Captain 20, the show that he had um, back in the day. And, oh my God, it's going to be great. He, uh, Dick was also in uh, some Don Dohler movies, you know, The Alien Factor, Night Beast celebrating its 40th anniversary, The Galaxy Invader. And uh, it's going to be a great conversation, you know, talk about the early days, you know, 70, early 70s to the mid 80s of horror hosting. I can't wait for this interview. And um, I am just with a heavy heart, I have to say, rest in peace, Leslie Jordan. A lot of you people know him from Will and Grace, you know, but I know him best as Murray Tuttle in Ski Patrol, going back to the age of eight when I was watching that movie. You know, he had that great line when he told uh, Sean Sullivan, Son, did anybody ever tell you you're a couple sandwiches short of a picnic? (laughs) <laughs> which I brought up to Sean when he was on here a few years ago. And, of course, he had probably the best death in uh, Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. And it's just going to be a sad loss to the industry. Leslie was a true original. I'll never forget that episode of Pee-wee's Playhouse when Lynn, playing uh, Missy Vaughn, is just so sweet to him after he has stolen Pee-wee's things. Uh, Busby was his name in that episode guy with such a remarkable, remarkable talent. Rest in peace, Leslie Jordan. So yeah, here is my interview with Dick Dizel, a.k.a. Count Gordeval. Hello, Dick Dizel here. Hey, Dick, welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? I am just rambling and scrambling and so happy I can't even stand myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good thing. <laughs> this is uh, such a great honor, sir. Thank you for taking the time today. No problem. No problem. It was either this or go to the dentist. I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it pretty painless for you, sir. I promise. So, going back in time, I was reading that uh, you graduated from Southern Illinois with a degree in uh, radio TV. So, I take it you gravitated toward radio and TV early on in your childhood. Wow, you know, it was interesting. A couple of years ago, uh, my daughter sent me a uh, thing called. Um, well, it was it was a thing where you you, you could you could uh, tell your life story. Yeah. And it was, it was and, I, and it ended up being put into a book so that she has a copy. I can have my granddaughter will be able to read it eventually. Uh, but anyway, the bottom line was I didn't realize how really interested and involved I was with uh, television and radio and all this uh, until I, I started really thinking about it. But yeah, I mean, the funny thing was I didn't realize it on a, oh, I could do this as a career thing. Oh, this is just what I'd like to do. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, uh, there was a time, and I guess, gosh, it had to be in the early 50s. We had gone on vacation. Maybe it was 54 or something like that. And, and um, we had bought a tele- and we had come back. We bought a television. And with the television, it was an Admiral TV, came a little um, punch-out paper thing that you could actually create a TV studio or a stage. And you had three, you know, paper cameras and, and right. a backdrop and little people with metal on the bottom and you had these little magnetic wands and you could move them around and I didn't go, wow, I forgot, totally forgot about that. Uh, when I was in high school, I tried to get a radio station started at our high school, didn't succeed. But it was only actually when I got into my freshman year in college and I had fluffed out of the uh, University of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> because I was in mechanical engineering and I had no aptitude for it, that a professor in the junior college that I went to said, why don't you go to Southern Illinois University? You seem to have a knack for this. And that's the rest is history. Wow. So, so who did you listen to on the radio growing up? Ah, uh, well, early 
I listened to a lot of radio drama because mm-hmm. uh, there was a, a, a Zenith two radio next to my bed. I also watched a ton of television. Uh, I had a, we had lived in a one bedroom apartment, so my bedroom was actually the dining room where the TV was. So from the time I was two years old, the television was in my room, and uh, I just watched a ton of television. Uh, listened to radio, bought a drama. So when we got to being a teenager and rock and roll, uh, it was uh, WLS had just started they had switch from a country station to a 50,000 watt rocker in Chicago. And uh, my, my, the DJ that I was enamored with was the nighttime guy, Dick Biondi. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I listened to a lot of him. Um, uh, funny story, <clears throat> when I was in high school, I wasn't doing really well in chemistry, uh, mm-hmm. chemistry, and I just didn't didn't agree. Um, but I went to a, I went to a school by the Christian that was run by the Christian Brothers of Ireland, and the, my, my chemistry teacher was the was the brother who was in charge of the sock cops after the basketball games, and that's where they made their money. They, you know, they, a lot of these kids, you know, they go into the sock cops, except they didn't want to have to pay bands because that's so I made him a deal. I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, I've got a, I'm got pretty good at editing tape, and I've got a lot of, I have my own tape recorder, real real tape recorder. I will provide you with music if you pass me in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I took, a, I took a microphone, put it against the speaker, and I recorded WLS, and I was editing out the disc jockeys of the commercials. I put it on real, real tape. We put it onto the school PA system, and I passed chemistry. Mm-hmm. Wow. What, what a merger, huh? <laughs> well, I learned a couple of things. One, I could, I could edit tape. Two, I could negotiate. Mm-hmm. And three, I, I found out that everything has a price. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Uh, did they have horror hosts in Chicago in those days? Yes, in 1957, uh, when uh, Screen Gems released the universal package of, of horror films to television, the uh, the Scream package, uh, WBKB, which was the ABC affiliate, uh, put on a show called Surprisingly Shock Theater. Yeah, and it was hosted by a guy by the name of Marvin. Who uh, was a beatnik? Oh. Not, he was not, not, not nothing to do with horror, except he had this woman who is his, his, we called Deer. It was his wife, mm-hmm. and we never got to see her face. She had this incredible body. <laughs> she had this blonde—I mean, really blonde, blonde hair—and uh, she always wore the sexy clothes. But we never saw her face. So the running gag was: she's this beautiful woman who has a face that could stop a clock. Wow, and uh, and that was a bit, and you know he would host he would host the movies. He actually had a band of zombies on a zombie band that would actually play music. He was a stage performer. Uh, he was an entertainer. Did, uh, did did stage shows, so this came natural for him. And he was on the air for a couple of years, and uh, I watched him religiously. I little had a little little altar there and incense and all. No, I'm kidding. That was that was. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, but, but Marvin was my introduction to, to horror movies, and I, 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 I just felt that you couldn't put a horror movie on television without a host. Yeah, because at that time, you know, there was Vampira in L.A. on the ABC affiliate, and the horror host was really starting to emerge at that time. But this guy you described, God, he sounds like uh, that's where the, the, the beatniks on Offbeat Cinema must have got their inspiration from. Could be. Now, you have to understand a couple of things. And, and you know, we take it for granted. Mm-hmm. And even up and through the 80s, it, we didn't, I did not know what was going on in other markets. This was before the Internet. This was before videotape, small videotape that you could, you know, Slip around, um, mm-hmm. and so I I didn't know what was going on in L.A. I didn't know what was going on in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which was ninety miles north of me. Right. Um, so I only knew what was in Chicago on the, on the four stations that were there, and that was it. Uh, so, I, funny. Can I, can I tell you a funny story about about other horror hosts? Of course. Okay. It's in the eighties. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm working at WDCA in Washington. 
I'm, I'm a pretty big deal there. You know, was, we had a very successful show. And I got a call from a reporter from TV Guide, and he's doing the annual Halloween issue, and he's interviewing horror hosts around the country. Right. So we, we do this interview. It was very, very pleasant, and it was over. And I said, hey, wait a second. Can I ask you a question? Because I'm curious. I said, where are you located? He says, well, I'm in L.A. I said, oh, gosh. You're familiar with Elvira. He goes, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I watch her every Saturday night. I go, mm-hmm. oh, God, tell me. All I'm familiar with Elvira is she sells Coors beer. Yeah. <laughs> she, was the, she was the spokesperson nationally for Coors beer. And I go, wow, what does she do? What? I want to find out what her bit was. I said, okay, tell me, what's her, what's her bit? What's her gig? And he didn't understand. And I said, well, okay, let, let, let's back it off a little bit. You come home on a Saturday night. Maybe you've had a few drinks. You come home, and you, uh, you're going to watch Elvira. He goes, yeah, that happens a lot. Okay. Mm-hmm. You turn your TV on. Yeah. You turn to the channel that she's on. Yeah. What happens? Well, there's this open, blah, 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 blah. And... Um, and then um, after the open, the camera goes on to her. And I said, what is she doing? Well, she's in this sexy outfit. Yes, I know she's in this sexy outfit. But what is she doing? She's lying on this couch or a divan or whatever. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, I get the picture. Now, what does she do to host the movie? And he, there's this big, long, pregnant pause. And I'm going, yeah. And he says, well, I, I really don't know. I don't know how to describe it. And I says, well, well, why are you watching this? He goes, well, I'm waiting for her to fall out of her costume. <laughs> awesome. And I said, well, that's, some, that's, those, that's something I'll never be able to do. <laughs> no one's going to sit there watching me waiting to fall out of my tuxedo. You know? It's like, okay. But, you know, really, I only had met up until, up until I got on the Internet in 98 as the first horror host on the Internet. Mm-hmm. I had not met another live horror host except for uh, Dr. Shock in Philly. He had, he, he had, he was, his wife was having some medical stuff done in Washington, and he was down. He had some time to kill, so he called me, and we got together for lunch. That was the only ho- other horror host up until the 90s that I ever had a chance to interplay with. Interesting, interesting. So after uh, college, how did you end up in Kentucky? Well, that was easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the job was there. <laughs> uh, you have to understand something. You know, one of the things you learn, in, at least at that point in broadcasting, was wherever mm-hmm. the job was, you needed to take it. Mm-hmm. I don't care what the cost was, what the, the price was, how much you were getting paid. You had to get experience because no one made it to a major market without experience. So you had to work your way up. Mm-hmm. So when I graduated school, uh, I couldn't get a job because I had no experience. I had worked a little bit at uh, some of the local radio stations in Southern Illinois, mm-hmm. but it still wasn't enough. And I'll be honest with you, uh-huh. I'm not a terribly wonderful um, rock and roll disc jockey. I mean, uh-huh. uh, I just uh, I, compared to a lot of other guys, so I don't have that. I don't have that deep voice that resonates from down around my knees, you know. So okay. <laughs> Yeah, you, first you were Bozo the Clown on uh, WDXR TV. How was that gig? Well, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. So I, I went to, mm-hmm. I went, went for a short time to uh, to a station in South Southwest Metro, South mm-hmm. East Missouri KHAD. It was a country station. I spent six weeks there. Mm-hmm. They were going to go. They were a daytimer, so daytime got short, and they had to cut somebody, and the guy, my, the general manager says, well, look, Dick, you're too good for this station, so you're, if I don't cut you, you're going to leave at the first opportunity, so you're fired. But he gave me a great recommendation. Simultaneously, a friend of mine was working in Paducah at the, uh, at the middle of the road, the, the uh, easy listening station, and he said, hey, they've got a, an opening for the morning guy. And I said, well, I can do a morning show. That's, that's not the other heavy rock and roll. So I badgered the general manager into giving me the job. So I got the job as rock and roll morning jock. But what I didn't know was the station had a construction permit to build the first UHF station in, in that area. And everyone that would worked in the radio station got a shot at, at doing a TV job. 
to make a start, long story short, mm -hmm. uh, the general manager came up to me and says, how would you like to be Bozo? And I said, no. And he said, do you like kids? I said, no. <laughs> no. Are you going to shave your beautiful handlebar mustache? No. I want you to interview for this job. And I go, why would I do that? He says, well, because we know who's going to be Bozo. We already have that already. But we have this guy from Larry Harmon Picture Corporation, and we want to show that there's multiple candidates. So just go interview. So I interview with, with this guy, and he, I give him the same thing. Do you want to do this? No. Blah, 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 blah. Next thing I know, Dwayne, who is the guy who is supposed to be Bozo, and I are on my way to Dallas for training. And the idea was whoever mm -hmm. would be the uh, do the best job and learn fastest, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would become Bozo, and the other person would be the backup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I could do that. Well, we got there. I did have to trim my hair, I did have to shave my mustache, I did, but it was the best thing I ever did because I got to learn how to do television rather than radio. I learned the secrets of, of being a television producer and what goes into it, particularly in a small market. And I ended up being, they ended up picking me as I negotiated actually for some more money, not much, but uh, we did Bozo. And yeah, that's a, that's how I got the thing. But you have to understand something else. Uh -huh. I was in a conference room with the general manager, who was a young guy. He probably was only twenty-four or five years old. Something like that. he was much older than I was. He's a promoter, uh, promoted rock concerts, and uh, we're watching a bunch of film opens. That you know, it's a, a, the eight o'clock movie, the sixteen millimeter films, or or and up comes. And I'm, I'm, this is 2 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. we're have, I'm with a couple other people. We're drinking beer and eating pizza. We're, we're, we're three sheets to the wind. And up comes this thing, Night of Terror with empty graves. And I just leaned back and blurted out, that's what we need, a horror host. <laughs> and the general manager turned around and said, you're hired. Did you find out later that you had just replaced uh, Willard Scott as Bozo? I had no idea who Willard Scott was. Now, this is still, this is still Paducah. Okay, let's go back to this still Paducah. Uh -huh. uh, so, so, you know, we did a successful run, but by 19... That, that, I started working there in 71, but seven, actually 70. Uh, in 72, early 72, I was burned out. I was doing 100-hour weeks. I was still doing my radio show. I was doing Bozo Live every day for an hour. I was doing night radio news on weekends. I was night anchor until 10.20 when I threw it to the um, sports guy. And then I had 10 minutes to go into the bathroom, turn into a vampire, and do a live show till midnight, mm -hmm. actually 12.30. And then on weekends, I was air shift uh, engineer, and I was putting in an hour weeks. So I quit, mm -hmm. sold a car. Packed up everything. My wife and I, I just got married. We'd gone to Europe. We said, we're going to stay here until we run out of money. And then I got a call with the job from Washington to, to do Bozo. And uh, we negotiated it out. I, went, I got to do Bozo in Chicago, or in Washington. I did not know, but I, had, I knew, did not know who Willard Scott was. And I did not know he had been Bozo. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's funny how it was a, such a small world back then, you know. I mean, uh, everybody knew knew each other. There was no internet, you know, and you, you never knew who was going to become famous. You never knew who was going to become iconic. It, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, someday I really hope to be, uh, you know, noted for something or another. But <laughs> Oh, did you, when... Um, so when you were playing Bozo, did you ever get to meet the original Vance Colvig Jr.? No. As a matter of fact, the only person we were permitted to meet was Larry Harmon himself, because okay. he controlled Bozo very tightly. There was only one Bozo, and that was him. <laughs> Everyone else had to, we were not allowed to even put ourselves in the credits, mm -hmm. uh, because there was only one Bozo. And uh, I did Bozo for five years in, in Washington, mm -hmm. and then I got really tired of it. I, they, they, they had me also doing another kid's character called Captain 20, who was actually on more than anyone else in Washington, because he dropped in between, did promos and contests between kids' shows every half hour, in the morning and the afternoon, right. all pre-taped. And then I wanted to do the vampire thing, and the general manager didn't want me to do it. I don't huh. know, I, to this day I still don't know specifically why. Um, but we fought and fought and fought. I actually ended up doing 
uh, my first gig as a vampire on the Bozo Show uh, because they couldn't stop me because I was producing the Bozo Show and we did split screen. Um, but then eventually, on February 3rd, 1972, Creature Feature went out of the air with Count Gorge of Alban. Yeah. Next, uh, next February, it'll be 50 years. Ah, oh, congrats. Yeah, so when you were playing Bozo, did you have to cover up your mustache, or did you not have a mustache at that time? <laughs> mustache, yeah. I had the mustache. Uh, I didn't grow the mustache until uh, 77, so it was five. Yeah, I had it for a little while. I, I, I was on a trip to Japan. Uh, I like travel, and mm-hmm. we were visiting my wife's uh, sister in Japan. Right. And I grew well, I was there, and I liked it. And I came back, and the program director says, okay, Dick, uh, what do you do with a mustache? I said, I said, I'm going to keep it. He goes, no, you can't. Bozo doesn't have a mustache. I said, yeah, but the Count can't have a mustache. He says, yeah, but Bozo can't have a mustache. Yeah. I said, Captain 20 can have a mustache. He says, yes, but Bozo can't have a mustache. And I said, that's why they invented wicked liquid latex. <laughs> <laughs> so I would put the liquid liquid latex on and cover up my mustache, put the makeup on over it, then mostly it worked, but it got to be a pain. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the reasons why Count Gordeval is so is so iconic is because he's Dracula with a mustache, you know? I mean, you, he, he gave him a very distinctive look. Well, that's true. The, the unfortunate part is that, or I don't the, the interesting part is the fact that the portrait that we have on the set, mm-hmm. which was given to me in 74, doesn't have the mustache. And, uh, and the woman whose mother painted the portrait is, is adamant that she says, Dick, I still don't like you with the mustache. I said, but Eleanor, we've been in three movies together. We've done all this stuff together. She says, I still don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least she—at least you know she's your friend because you know if she, if because you know at least you know she's honest with you. Or otherwise, she would have walked away a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things I find, you know, mm. if you're honest with people, yeah, you, you don't you don't try to screw them over and you don't lie to them. You try to be diplomatic if you think it's going to hurt, but you still got to be honest. And I find that for long-term relationships, that works the best. Absolutely. I think honesty is the best policy, regardless what other people say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so um, M.T. Graves, you know, he was the the seed planted for, for Count, right? But then once you did uh, play Count, you know, you moved to Washington, D.C., and then the character became just a mainstay, right? Yeah, and we had we had the change name. General manager was aware of that because he had a he had a place in Miami. He was aware that there was an empty graves in Miami, and I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. So I said, "Okay, change the name." I said, "What do you want?" He goes, "Well, something something with some gore in it." I said, "Oh, <laughs> how about Count Gore?" And uh, and then and I said, "He said, hmm, I like it, but it needs something more." And I was so frustrated at this point. I mean, I was in his very tiny office between his desk and the wall behind me which was about three foot of space and I just I just threw my hands up in the air and I turned and I said how about something off the wall like Gore Duvall and he said hmm Count Gore Duvall I like it let's go with it yeah (laughs) and the first movie you showed was House of Frankenstein yes Uh uh-huh People still go ask me, how did you come up with the name? Is it a takeoff on Gore Vidal, who lived in Washington, who was a very famous author, who's not one of his books that I read. Mm. Uh, I said it could have been because afterwards I found out that there was a copy of uh, a Gore Vidal book on my general manager's desk. But most likely, every day I drove to the station past the Duvall funeral home. So there you go. Wow. And so uh, you grew up loving the uh, the creature feature movies. Like, what were your favorites? I was really into the big bug movies. Mm-hmm. I, I always liked horror movies. I mean, I obviously liked the uh, you know, Dracula and the werewolf, but you know, Frankenstein you know, it had a lot of science in it, a lot of sparkling sparks and mm-hmm. noise and stuff. And so I liked the, you know, like, uh, it came from outer space, a tarantula, mm-hmm. um, uh, Fly, the, the, the man, it, we had a whole bunch of those big bug movies, all with radiation. Uh, also, the attack of the 50-foot woman, because obviously she was 
fifty foot of really beautiful woman. But that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I love all the Universal monster movie stuff and all the public domain stuff. You know, there's just there's just nothing like it. Um, yeah, so you were showing all of that stuff. You're showing any Ray, Ray Harryhausen? Uh, the only Ray Harryhausen movie that um, no, no, I don't think I right off the top of my head. I I have to look at my list of PD films, but I don't think any of his are PD. I know one of my one of my favorite movies that I've shown. Uh, we three times a year we live host. Um, films of my choice at the American Film Institute in Washington. Matter of fact, this coming Saturday, I'll be uh, hosting Nightmare on Elm Street there. Um, nice. But I got to pick one of my favorite movies that I, I hosted many times on Channel 20, and that was Earth versus the Flying Saucers, which of course is where Washington gets destroyed by Ray, Ray Harryhausen Flying Saucers. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I like that one. Uh, were, were you attending the very early horror conventions as count? You know, I don't think I did my first horror convention again until we went on to the internet back in the late 90s. Really? Uh, yeah, we... Uh, no, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say it. We did do... Uh, back in the 70s, I was a regular at the at Balticon, which is Baltimore Science Fiction Society hmm. convention, but I was... as as I just went as Dick. Hmm. Uh, a couple times, they had their own vampire, um... Uh, Marty Gear played a vampire, and he hosted the costume competition. So I, yeah, that's fine, Marty. Mm. Well, he did do a great job. Um, and uh, but I did appear at a couple of those later on as the count. Uh, but those were not really horror conventions per se. Like I said, the uh, I started doing a couple um, early in, in, in the late '90s, and then then I became a regular at Horror Find, which was in the north of Baltimore on a regular basis every year. I, I think I did the first uh, first 12 of them, and uh, mm -hmm. it was, it was, that was a blast. Yeah, because I heard back then, like, no one was going to the cons. They were very empty, you know, but now every con is, is pretty much packed. You know, it's, it's really evolved. Oh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it has evolved. It, you know, it used to be, you know, you had your horror conventions, you had your science sick science fiction conventions, then you started mixing the two together. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I remember I was at one convention that I knew everybody there, but I came as Gore, and I had I had fans, guests, you know, paying guests come up to me and say, tell, tell me to get out. This is a science fiction convention. A vampire has no business here. And I was really, <laughs> I've never <laughs> been back to that convention. <laughs> but, uh, uh -huh. it, but then they started mixing a lot of things. Uh, the one that I'm familiar with, I'm uh, is Awesome Con in Washington, uh, where they have science fiction, horror, comics, uh, authors, uh, cosplay. They mix them all together, and on any one weekend, you'll have 60,000 people go through there. Nice, nice. But it's that huge. Yeah, it's it's become a, a cottage industry. The convention scene. It's so many celebrities who you would never think do them do them now. You know, it, it's 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 quite it's quite bizarre. But you know, it makes people happy at least. Yeah, and you know, you can you you can sample a bit of everything. Now, I, I will relate my yeah. You know, basically, at, at, well, I am a, a, a an actor, mm -hmm. and I I, I I have some celebrity status which is why I get invited to these things. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still a fanboy at heart. Uh, so I think it was at my second awesome con. Um, they asked me, would you be willing to uh, moderate the Q&A for Billy Piper? Mm -hmm. And I, I had just become a huge doc, a, a Doctor Who fan. Mm -hmm. And I oh, well, <laughs> twist my arm, you know? Hey. <laughs> so I meet Billy, as you meet most of your people you're going to deal with. Now, she, I consider her a, you know, an A celebrity. There's no question. Anyone who's worried about Doctor Who's an A celebrity, and I'm back here at a C minus. Okay, so, so oh, yeah. I'm, I'm waiting outside in, in the service hallway, and so we're chatting up a little bit, and uh, she's very pleasant, and uh, mm. uh, I tell her how I'd, I'm going to approach it, and she says, yeah, that works good. And uh, my, jo my job basically was to make sure that everything ended exactly at the time it was supposed to end, and no one 
was cut off and felt left out. So I, I had to guess how long it would take X number of people to get through the line. So I'm, I'm doing all this. This is what I do. I'm a host. I mean, I, 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 that's what I do for a living. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm doing this. And I'm, I'm enjoying this. And I, 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 matter of fact, I really, I set off the crowd and said, yeah, that I told her I, 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 I was not a Doctor Who fan. And they were like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, said, I said, but you did let me finish. I was not a Doctor Who fan until I turned on and saw an episode called Rose. And then we went, yeah. Okay, so suddenly I have everyone on my side. And, and, and so we bring in Billy Piper. Anyway, to make the long story short, we get done with the whole thing. We, we go back out into the service hallway. And she says, hey, uh, could you do me a favor? I said, well, sure, what? And she says, can I get a picture with you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm looking at her going, no, 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 it's supposed to go the other way around. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you do. You can get a picture of me if I can get a picture with you. And she smiled and said, sure. So we took, we had her manager take, not her manager, her handler take pictures of both of us. And I was, in, I was floating on like a cloud. I mean, gosh, I got to meet a really big celebrity. This is cool. I, I, it made my weekend. So I go back to my table. My business manager's there. I'm saying, well, I explained the whole thing. And I'm just starting to come down, and here comes this guy in a three-piece suit at a, mm-hmm. at a horror science fiction convention. This is not good news. So this guy comes up to me and says, in his British accent, I won't even try. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm Billy Piper's manager. I said, oh, what did I do wrong? He goes, absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, Billy was so impressed, she wouldn't stop talking about you. What a great job you did. And I'm impressed that she's impressed. I just want to come over here and shake your head and say thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm going, uh, somebody's business manager walked across this huge floor all the way over here just to shake my head and hand and thank you for doing what I was supposed to do with his class. It, it, that's my, that's my, that's my uh, celebrity story. <laughs> Do you have any favorite celebrity interviews you've done? Oh, so many. My, the one I've done the most and a person I really enjoy interviewing is uh, uh, Hold It. <laughs> Dee Wallace. Uh, uh, Dee Fane and Cujo. Love Dee. Uh, yeah, she's been on four times. I love her. Yeah, she's, and I just saw her at the Scares and Care this past summer, and, and she's just an awesome person. We, we, we've always had a good time together. Uh, 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 Sid Haig, mm-hmm. really great guy. Uh, uh, Bruce Campbell. Yeah. Bruce Campbell and I did four of the horrifying conventions together. We did, we did the costume contests together. And he was always just a blast to be with. He's just a fun person. Um, has a very interesting sense of humor. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, what? Gosh, I've, been, I've done so many of them. You know, I'm, I'm kind of off. Um, oh, what was his name? Uh, I think it's just, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Uh, Barry, Barry, Barry. Uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, okay. yeah. A, a, a lot, a lot of good people, uh, and uh, always enjoyed being with them. That's great. So, how do you meet and get involved with Don Doler? Uh, I, I was impertinent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I always admired filmmakers, young filmmakers, and particularly amateur filmmakers. Uh, I think it takes a lot to get into the film industry, especially mm-hmm. if you're on the East Coast, because. There's no connection to the West Coast. Anyway, so I heard that there was a group of people up in Baltimore making a horror movie. And uh, I said, well, hey, let's have them on the show. So uh, through one of my friends up in Baltimore, they arranged to have Don and three or four of his uh, cohorts come down, and we interviewed him on the show and learned out about learned about the alien factor. And this was fun. And I'm, and I'm not you know, talking, it was over. It's over, and they're about ready to leave, and I said, I, I've got to ask one question. He goes, oh, well, yeah, what is it? I said, I said, you're on my show here. I'm, I'm, I'm pumping the hell out of this thing to promote it. Uh, why didn't you ever consider asking me to be in the movie? <laughs> <laughs> Impertinent. And he looked at me, and he looked at the other guys, and he said, well, we had, but we didn't think you'd be interested. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I said, well, I am. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> he goes, <laughs> he said, well, let us talk about it. 
so a couple of days later, he calls me and says, uh, we rewrote the script and uh, expanded the part of the mayor. You'll play the mayor. I go, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I got to know Don. And uh, Tony Malinowski and, uh, and on that whole rest of the crew there. And we, we, uh, we were in Alien Factor, followed it up with Night Beast, followed it up with Galaxy Invader, followed that up with Crawler, uh, and got to know a whole bunch of other people. Uh, uh, and just, uh, yeah, it's been wonderful. Because it, the, 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 the wonderful thing about this was being with a group of really creative people who really are dedicated to their art. Yeah. There's nothing more inspiring. I don't care if it's a film, radio, TV, stage, to be around that kind of atmosphere is just, it, it's electrifying. It really is wonderful. Did, did, did you think right away that he was this mad genius filmmaker? I'm sorry, I, I, we broke up a little bit. What was that? Did you, did you know right away that this guy was a mad genius filmmaker? Uh... Sort of, yeah. Uh, you know, it, yeah, we, yeah. Look, uh -huh. I, I, I knew once we got him on the show. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, when talking talking with these folks on the show, it was it was inspiring. That that's what that's what you know got me to be impertinent. Yeah, because um, the first movie you did with him was the Alien Factor. Is there any good stories you got there about that? Uh, oh, there's a, a bunch of. You know, funny stories of actually making it. First of all, the film was supposed to have been finished by the time it got to winter. Mm -hmm. Then it started snowing, then they had to rewrite stuff in it. And there was one, one scene in particular, uh, and you probably, you've seen the film, right? Oh, of course. Okay, because the scene where the mayor and um, Zachary walk up to the spaceship. Okay, mm -hmm. it's in the snow, okay? Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out how are they going to shoot this? I mean, we don't have any special effects. This is way before computers. I mean, anyway, this is like, how do you do this? So I'm, I'm, I'm interested. So what they had done is they had taken this toothpaste holder, a toothbrush holder, it had toothbrush, it had blah, 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 it had a bunch of toothbrush holders, they put toothbrush in okay, and they modified it, and da, 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 put it into a uh, crash, they made it look like it crashed, and then since we're out in the snow, this is on, it, the whole thing is on a platform, a plywood platform about a foot square, and they, and they, they pack it with snow, they say, okay, we're going to do what's called force perspective, mm -hmm. I know I'm familiar with that, you know, basically you have infinite depth of field if it's bright enough, well, he said, it's going to snow, and this weekend it's going to get cold, and we have a spot, and it's basically this valley that runs through this part of upstate Maryland where they have all these high-tension wires. And they went up on one hill, way up there. I mean, they had to be 200 yards away. I could barely see them. I could, couldn't hear them when they said action. And they said, okay, we're going to, what, what, what I, we call action, you and Zachary walk that way. I go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Trust me, it does. And that's what we did. We were about 200 yards away, way downhill. He was up here. The camera was literally right in front of this toothbrush holder, shooting in this incredibly bright sunlight. And we had, that camera was in focus from there all the way down to where we were. Wow. Like we're walking up there. It was the most, and, and while we were waiting for the setup, uh, Don Lightford and I found some, some, big pieces of cardboard left over from a refrigerator and we ended up turning it into a toboggan and we're sliding up and down the hill and trying to <laughs> keep having a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I watch it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for that. That's so cool. Yeah. Can, can you believe it's the 40th anniversary of Night Beast? No, I didn't realize that. Wow, I've been so tied up with the anniversary, because we have, we have the 50th anniversary coming up next year of the uh, Creature Feature, mm -hmm. the 25th anniversary of our web program, Creature Feature, the weekly web program at CountCore.com, yeah. and it'll be the 5th anniversary of our Roku channel, so I missed Night Beast altogether. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it still holds up. I watched it yesterday, and I was like, wow, God, this is a true throwback to 50s B-movies, if ever there was one. Um, what, what, what was making that movie like? I, that, was a, that really was a lot of fun for a couple reasons. One, mm -hmm. uh, Eleanor, my, who, 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 
Eleanor Herman, who plays my secretary, mm-hmm. who's also in Alien Factor as the young girl who sh- kept screaming. Uh, right. And her mother was one, again, her mother was one that painted the portrait of Gore. So, and Eleanor had grown up very nicely, and she was now my secretary. So I'm, I'm, I'm no longer playing to a teenage girl. I'm playing to this very attractive young lady. So this, as a, as a, as a lecherous mayor, that's okay. Uh, we had a, we had a poolside scene, so she's in the bathing suit, which didn't hurt any. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like how you know you got you got your Hawaiian shirt on and you're arguing with the sheriff, and you got a, an airhead wife there. <laughs> well, not wife. Secretary. Secretary, I'm sorry. Secretary. Yes, I would never I would never do that with a wife. I mean, only a secretary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a really yeah. cool movie. Um, is it true that young J.J. Uh, Abrams wrote the music? Uh, for Alien Factor. Or was it Night Beast? No, I guess, I guess it was Night Beast. It said uh, Night Beast, yeah. He was like 16 or something. Yeah, yeah. Don, got t- Don was in touch with some of the folks in, uh, in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, he had Cinemagic magazine out, which was a, a magazine for amateur filmmakers, to how to make your basically Super 8 and, uh, and well, I guess, some 16 millimeter and the tricks of the trade. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, J.J. had read Cinemagic and got in touch with Don. They were communicating, and Don said, well, you know, do music. He goes, yeah. So they just, yeah, that's how, it, I, that's how it came about. Crazy, crazy. Um, I've talked to Ted Bohus. He's an interesting guy. What was he like to work with? Uh, I didn't get to inter- interact with him too much. Um, most of my scenes, matter of fact, I don't ha- don't have any scenes with him. So I did. I only got to ha- interact with Ted at conventions. Um, so I it, I can't answer really that question. Yeah, he's a, he's he's an interesting guy. There's a, like an extended love making scene in this movie. I can't think of another movie of this caliber to have like an extended love making scene in it. It was just like almost a, a different movie for a few minutes there, you know. Well, I have to admit, I I, used, I was chiding Don when he started working on on Night Beast. I said, you know, hey, look, mm-hmm. you know, movies are getting sexy. Yeah. I mean, so we gotta have gotta have a little skin in this thing. So I thought the skin was with the uh, the swim the, the uh, swim party. Okay, well, that would have been fine. And then 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 he pulls this one out, and uh, actually, actually it's, it, it's it, it, it was it, it was controversial when they shot it. It was controversial when Edna, the cast finally saw it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was kind of controversial when the sheriff's wife saw it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, like what were the screenings like for his movies? I can imagine that it was probably pandemonium. It was, they were all a lot of fun. They they I, they would have them at uh, some. They'd have them Baltimore at mm-hmm. usually a, a regular one screen big theater. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's nothing. The first time I went to see uh, Alien Factor was up in Baltimore, and uh, there's nothing like the first time seeing yourself on a big screen. I mean, it just is just awesome. I mean, you just, you just, you feel so small looking at it and you go, God, if I had a mustache. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's it's funny, you know, um, there were, Baltimore had like a weird indie filmmaking scene, you know, back in the day with guys like, like him, like Don Dohler, John Waters, and they would like hire all these people who were just like cut from a different cloth, you know, and, and do all these strange things on, on film. It, it's, it's really interesting when you think about it. And there's one guy who, who transitioned between those, George Stover. He was an actor that yeah. worked for Waters and Dohler. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's funny. You, you know, you mentioned that sex scene. Um, a couple of years later, uh, Don calls me and says, "We're doing a we're doing a, a quickie. It's called the Galaxy Invader. I want you to be, uh, <laughs> I want you to in it." And I go, "Okay, uh, Don, I'll do it on three conditions. Mm-hmm. You're, you're giving me conditions." I said, "Well, I'm not even at. I, I, we even let's not even talk about pay. Here are the three conditions. One, um, I have just restored a 1964 Studebaker Avanti, and I want it prominently in the film." He goes, okay, we can have you driving a sexy car. Okay, good. Two, I want a bedroom scene. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, okay, what's the third one? I said, the third one is I don't want to read any of your lines. He goes, what? I said, 
said, here's the, here's the deal. Uh, Don, I love you like a director and a brother. And I said, you're really a good director, great editor, but you write in a single voice. All your characters sound the same. So, so here's the deal. Mm-hmm. I'll take you. I'll take your script. I read the script. It's a good script. Except, I'll take the, the words that you say for the. I played a college professor, and I'll put it into words that a college professor would say. It'll make. No, I won't change any meaning. Mm-hmm. But it'll be the college professor's voice. Yeah. With some reluctance, he agreed, and I said, "Okay." And uh, so he said. First thing we're going to do is shoot the bedroom scene. I said, okay. So I trundle on up there. He said, okay. He said, uh, I want you to you know, strip down to your, your, your shorts and yeah. get in the bed over there. And I go, yeah, what are you, what's going to happen next? He says, the phone's going to ring. You're going to answer it. You're going to agree to go meet with this kid, and that's your bedroom scene. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, that's not what I had in mind. He says, see, you got to be specific. Yeah. And then you go from being the mayor to being a doctor in the Galaxy Invader. What was that movie like? Oh, the Galaxy Invader was fun, too. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed it because, one, again, I could feel more comfortable with the character because I was actually putting the words in the character's mouth. Uh, and, again, I'm around my friends. I mean, look, when, you, when you're when you working with folks, this is your third, uh, third time out with a lot of these folks, you know, hey, this this is fun. We get together. You know, have a have a few beers afterwards, and uh, and uh, enjoy enjoy ourselves. Uh, but it was it was it was good. Now I got to die three ways. First one, the uh, Zagatil tore my face up. Second one, uh, the monster ripped my head off. And the third one, I just got shot. But that was that was actually the toughest one because then it was like I'm running away from the guy, and the guy said, so so I said so the guy just shoot me in the back. That means the bullet is going to hit me, and I would most likely fall forward. I wasn't really crazy about falling on my face. Yeah. (laughs) We practiced a little bit. I I, I, I fell down on my knees and then rolled down. Okay, that worked. But uh, it turns out that I have had a tendency to die well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to die in all of them, actually, right? Yeah, even uh, Return of the Devil Bat, I get uh, torn apart by a giant bat. Uh, that was kind of cool. I didn't die in um, Crawler, but that was really true. That was just a cameo scene. Yeah. Let, I was a played a lecherous mayor again. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Faye, Faye, Faye Tillis, who played the daughter in the Galaxy Invader, she was pretty good. Do you know what ever happened to her? No, I uh, uh, actually of that of that cast, uh, the only person that I am still in contact with is George Stover. Several of them have passed, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that that's kind of kind of sad. I occasionally keep in touch with some of the folks from uh, from Alien Factor uh, and some from Night Beast. Um, every when I, when I go out to the West Coast, I see Tony Melanowski out there and. Uh, and when I go up to Baltimore occasionally, we'll see folk up there. So yeah. Nice. Did you remain in touch with Dollar until he passed? Uh, yeah, on and off. Uh, for a while, I, I moved to, my, my wife got a job transfer, uh, and uh, we moved to Chicago for 10 years. And during that time, I had nothing to really talk to Don about. Um, he had started working with uh, Joe Ripple on, on uh on, on some film projects, and um, that's when I, I got a call from him to do uh, Galaxy Invader. Um, but uh, then when I got back, I, I, got, I, I went to visit Don, and I said, I looked in the backyard, I said, Don, uh, where's that? Where's, where's the swimming pool? He goes, ah, he wasn't using it, so I just buried it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving right along, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, are you going to be play? So, uh, you mentioned before about that Nightmare on Elm Street screening this weekend. All right, so you are you gonna, so you're going to be playing uh, Count uh, then. Uh, are you going to uh, do like a Halloween special? Uh, anything this year? No, I actually, you know, 
we're going to do the same thing we do at every one of these things. And mm -hmm. the, the, we have it formatted, and the crowd seems to like it. We started off with about 10 minutes of clips from my old shows, not only from TV, but also from the Internet. Like I said, I've got 25 years on the web, so, mm -hmm. hey, I've got lots of video footage. Not so much from the early 70s, um, because film was, or tape was very expensive, and right. we... We ran it till the oxide came off. Um, uh, and then, so we, we do that, then I get introduced. Sometimes I'll have, a, I'll have someone working with me, uh, Arch Campbell, who's the uh, local, who was, was the local NBC um, uh, movie critic. He will sometimes come on. Or, uh, uh, Tony Perkins from Five. Uh, they'll kill, come on, sometimes come on, but then I'll come on. We'll, I'll do a, I'll do a monologue, maybe mm -hmm. a seven, eight minute monologue, and then uh, we'll have a contest, some kind of an activity game. This, this goes back to Bozo days, of, uh, and this this week we're going to do a, a, a cup and plate stacking game and give away some prizes, uh, and then we'll go to the movie. We don't stop the movie because it's literally too complicated the way their projection system works. And then afterwards, I come back out and thank everybody and then promote the, the next one. And the next one will be in February of 2023. And it will be the big 50th anniversary. And uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll have some special stuff for that one. Nice. Uh, you know, it's, back in the day, you know, being a horror host was kind of a, um, <clears throat> an aesthetic slash marketing ploy, you know, for the, the networks to garner better ratings. It seems like today with the advent of the internet, anybody can be a horror host. Do you think that has taken the special nature of being a horror host out of the equation? No, 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 no. Because I, I gotta, I've got to have a feeling that even though we didn't hear, they have never heard about a lot of them, I'm sure that there were a lot of horror hosts we've never heard about in the 50s mm -hmm. when the shock package came out. And, and in the 60s, too, again, the smaller markets would, would do this. Uh, I mean, I, even, I know, I know a lot of people who are involved in, in, in the horror-related stuff, and uh, I think it's always going to be there. You basically had three waves. You had your, your VHS wave. This was the 57 wave, okay? Yeah. And then when that kind of petered out and, the, and television became profitable enough and there was enough program material, the VHS stations started getting Hollywood syndicated stuff and they didn't need the, 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 the horror films and the posts, so they, they died. But then the UHF came about to the second generation, that's where I entered the picture, uh, mm -hmm. where they now have access to these old horror films that the VHS stations had kind of discarded, and they needed to... One of the things that people don't think about is why, one of the reasons why they hosted these things was to expand the showcase. Right. Most of these films are only 60-some, most of them don't even make it to 70 minutes. And, you know, if you're going to sell commercial time, you better have more than 60 or 70 minutes. Right. Um, you can expand it to, to 90 minutes or sometimes maybe two hours and get a lot of commercials in. Uh, and it's cheap. <laughs> we didn't get paid a whole lot, um, but uh, so so then the second wave came in on television, mm -hmm. and then when that started petering out in the eighties, cable access was there, and there were just uh, scads and scads of cable access people doing this, and and some of them went on to uh, to the re it is now a rebirth of horror hosting on television. I mean, led by, of all people, by Sven, Son of Senghuli, or Senghuli Rich Cause in Chicago. I mean, he right now is the hot, hot property. He's a great guy. I have a personal friend of mine, and, uh, you know, he, he happened to be in the right place at the right time, and he's very talented. And, uh, you know, so now he's inspiring a ton of people to get involved. And so I, I think the more the merrier. I, you know, it's like everything else, if you, people will rise... People with, with talent and, 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 and some uniqueness will rise above the others and become better known and, get, and opportunities may open up for them. So, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Did, did you know Bob Wilkins? Uh, again, West Coast. I've not. A, yeah. <laughs> I've only been to the West Coast twice in my life. <laughs> and most of them were through airports. Um, so, no, I, did, I didn't know Bob Wilkins. Because that guy was everywhere. I mean, everybody knew him. He was very respected across the board as a horror host. Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
And then the guy that replaced him, John Stanley, you know, I, I've interviewed him a couple of times. He's a great guy. Yeah, I, 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 know, I know him very, not very well, but it's, again, we hang out at conventions together. A very, very fine person. Um, yeah. Uh, we had, we've been to a couple of conventions and we had, there was a horror hound convention, uh, I guess about a dozen years ago, where mm-hmm. we actually had a hundred horror hosts in the hotel. Now, someone once asked me, I once asked me, do you ever have a horror host convention? And I said, no. They said, why? Huh. There's no building in the world big enough to hold the egos. Yeah. <laughs> but it, somehow, it's fun- this, these hundred people managed to condense it all, and we had a great weekend. So, yeah. It's, it's funny you say that, though. Every horror host I have met and interviewed is a sweet, sweet person. There are a few, there are a few exceptions to that rule. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, there's a few exceptions to every rule. I mean, and, and yeah, yeah, most of the people are very cooperative. I mean, that's why you have uh, things like Vortex, which is a uh, uh, streaming channel that's got lots of horror hosts. Uh, uh, what's the other one? There's another one. Uh, I'm about getting blanky. There's two major showcases that are just riddled with horror hosts. I mean, they're, they're just chock full of them. And uh, I think it's great. Uh, they, they've come together and formed this uh, this commune, <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, and it, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I've I've talked to like Penny Dreadful, you know, over in Boston. Oh, what a sweetie, huh? Yeah. Oh my God, she did something really, really. Um, you know, bold. I mean, she, you know, started on cable access and then just word of mouth just spread, you know, this is like right when the internet was starting to get really popular and it's amazing, you know, what she did with it. You know, she doesn't do it as much these days, but oh my God, it was, it it was a phenomenon over there. Oh yeah. And then I, matter of fact, we, we've reconnected on and off a couple of times right now. We're more connected than we have been. It's unfortunate, you know, I, I moved to uh, southern Flo- southwestern Florida uh, mm-hmm. a number of years ago because, frankly, I don't like cold weather. Yeah. But I feel kind of removed because there's really not a lot going down on here. Uh, we have uh, Paul Bearer the second yeah. uh, out of Tampa. Paul Bearer was Paul Bearer and M.T. Graves were, were two of the big horror hosts in Florida back back in the day, and. Uh, uh, Rich Coon got permission to, to, to recreate the character on the CW up in Tampa. And I was on his show, he was on my show, but it, 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 it's not the same thing. I mean, there's just a plethora of, of horror hosts. You know, Ohio is just chock full of them. It must be the water. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and then up into up New England uh, where Tippetti is. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I miss seeing them. And I, it just it's almost now as far as going to LA. So mm-hmm. as a matter of fact, I'm looking forward. Ah, next month. The 18th, 19th, and 20th, I'm actually going to be the guest of honor at Preserve Halloween Fest in Irving, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, and I'm looking forward to this. So I haven't been back to Dallas since I did Bozo Training back in 1971. <laughs> Bozo Training. <laughs> I like that. That's a, good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, well, it was. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Uh, Actually, I've been trying to. I've, I've always been trying to connect with the guy who trained me, Doug Litton. Um, mm-hmm. And we've been trying to. There's a lot of people who are not on the internet, surprisingly, who were performers at one time, and it just kind of amazes me. But um, hopefully, he's alive. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I, he, may, he may not be. I know his partner, uh, Paul Osborne, died a fairly young death. Uh, and uh, but they taught me they taught me a lot about television and I, I owe a debt of gratitude to both of those guys and, mm-hmm. and Larry Harmon too for uh, teaching me how to uh, be a television performer. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Miss Misery up in San Francisco, and um, I'm proud to say I'm in her new book. Ah, excellent. Yeah, and she told me this. Uh, when I saw her at a con back in August, and I, I wanted to cry, but I was too tired because I'm not a morning person. Got up and went to the con, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, my friend drove me like three and a half hours out of the way. I was too tired and overwhelmed to to, to cry in that moment, but I cried later. So. Uh, well, that's good. I'm, I'm very well, happy. You know, it's 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 actually a fairly small world spread out. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I went down to uh, to Australia about five years ago to meet with the uh, folks down there in uh, in Sydney. Uh, they had a show out down there that actually uh, was very, very good, and uh, the Schlocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> I like that. That's a good Unfortunately, name. Unfortunately, because I was I was on the road for a month, I couldn't. I didn't have the flexibility of taking my costume with me, which is an entirely su- entire suitcase all by itself. <laughs> um, so we didn't get to do any television, but we did get to go to a pub and have way too many pints. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know the old um, the old saying: "Watch your p's and q's." That came from um, the the, uh, the Irish in in drinking. You know, mind your pints and quarts. That's what where it came from. Ah, all right. Well, there you go. But it hey. can, but it's it's spread across the board though, as you know, just be on your best behavior. But that's the origin of P's and Q's. Well, if you're if you if you're drinking your P's and Q's, you're probably behaving yourself. It's only afterwards that you. Become- yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. What, what's the craziest thing anyone's ever asked you to sign at a con? Uh, actually, unfortunately, not much. I mean, I, I've signed a couple of, of, of body, parts. body parts. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I get from horror people all the time. They say that it's always body parts. A couple of them don't mind it, but a couple of them are very uncomfortable. Well, you know, it all depends what body parts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and what what they're asking for, you know, but but usually it's 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 nothing too risque. Uh, so, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, convent people. I find people are very very friendly and nice at conventions. I've never been overwhelmed by anyone asking anything really too stupid. Um, uh, and I, I I like meeting with people. I like talking with people. Uh, it's obvious because we've been talking for a good long time, and uh, I'm still having to enjoying this. Um, so, yeah, um, I was trying to, sometimes people ask me uh, what were some of the, uh, some, what were some of the craziest things, but I'm, I'm not, again, most of the crazy, when we did the show on TV, you have to understand that unlike a lot of people, we, this was strictly uh, ad lib. This, this was, this was, you know, I didn't realize that I was doing stand-up, basically. No one ever told I did. I didn't <laughs> take my first acting chorus until 2000. Yeah. And that's when I realized, that's when I was told what I was doing was stand-up, basically. And uh, I had no inhibition about being an actor, so I, I let, let loose during rehearsals and practices and stuff. Right? So, so, but, uh, so we, and we, 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 we never really... Did any never did retakes because we always would just say okay that's that's the way it was and uh, uh, so there was nothing really to say oh this is so terrible we got to redo this over yeah and, <laughs> <air> it <laughs> yeah I did I did stand up for ten years it's it's a very hard gig you know it is and I'm I'm I'm, I'm now for the first time actually working on monologues. <laughs> <laughs> I'm finding out it's actually better, especially if you've got a limited time for like when you're, you know, okay, you've got seven minutes. You've got to capture your audience. You've got to get them on your side, and you've got to get them comfortable watching the show. Okay, wow. I better plan this one out. So, yeah. Matter of fact, one of my things to do on my list of things to do today is work on this weekend's monologue. Yes. Yeah, so aside from that screening and that um, the event you mentioned in Irving, Texas, do you have any other upcoming projects or con appearances you'd like to plug? Well, yeah, we have an April, well, let's see. Well, we have the, the, the in, on February 4th, we're back at the AFI in, in Washington for the 50th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Then we uh, are going to do Raven Con in, in uh, Richmond, Virginia in April. We may be doing the uh, Cinema Wasteland, which is always a, a, a fun party, uh, and that would be in uh, early April. And then we're going we're to do a total of four AFI events rather than three for next year. And uh, we're still booking uh, other events for, uh, for 2023. Of course, on the other hand, I'm also planning on doing a lot of traveling next year, too. So it's going uh, to be interesting. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I hope the screening goes great for you and uh, that event in Texas uh, goes just as well. And I thank you so much for coming on today, Dick. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I, I enjoy it. 
I, I'm, I'm hoping, I, I'm one of the few horror hosts that have a little strange thing about Halloween. I don't do a big thing about Halloween. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't make a big deal about it because I get to play Halloween the rest of the year. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'm serious. So yeah. Halloween is usually the day that I take off and let everyone else, let all the mere mortals go out, let their inhibitions down, get scary, get frightening, be creative be talented, get out there and do it. And I applaud you and I wish all your audience would do that. Think of me, hey, from, from a professional horror host, I'm taking the night off, Halloween night off, you get out there and you do your best. Boom, go get it. <laughs> all right, Dick, well, have a happy Halloween every day and the rest of the holidays and be safe out there. Oh, I forgot something. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Back in 09, uh -huh. uh, C.W. Prather, Prather created a, a, did a, a feature-length documentary on my career called mm -hmm. Every Other Day is Halloween. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's an awesome film. It covers Bozo, Captain 20, and The Count. It also covers my relationship with a lot of other horror hosts at that time. At the end of this month, hopefully this Saturday, mm -hmm. we're going to re-release the film as a, a Blu-ray with a mini-doc covering the last 12 years, plus a documentary called uh, Bald-Headed Blues, the story of Dr. Sarcophagi, who is another Washington horror host, mm -hmm. and a bunch, just a plethora of, of, of extra stuff, so, so big it had to go onto a Blu-ray. And uh, so that's coming out, and something to look for. It'll be out on, on I'll have some at my convention appearances, and also it'll be on Amazon. So every other day is Halloween Blu-ray. Oh, wonderful. And, you know, you should write a memoir because you've got some great stories. Oh, we, I, could, I could go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> consider it, if consider you, it. I mean, if you drink, I mean, if you drink, I could just go on forever. Okay, never mind. <laughs> okay, you have a great day, Dick. You too, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, bye. Well, there you have it. Dick Dizel, ain't he a cool dude? Oh, great guy, great stories there. I like how he's a little bit edgy, too, you know, um, unlike a lot of horror hosts, they want to keep their family-friendly family friendly brand branding, you know, um, you know, with the exceptions of Dick and maybe uh, Elvira and Miss Misery, but a lot of horror hosts like to be politically correct, but Don obviously wasn't afraid to be politically incorrect because he was acting in Don Dohler's movies, so that was a great talk we had. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes. <laughs>